Hey, and welcome everyone to Startup Savants, a podcast dedicated to helping aspiring entrepreneurs and startup enthusiasts by bringing you news, insights, and stories about the startups and founders that are making waves right now. I'm your host, Annika. And I'm your other host, Ethan. Our guest today is Lizia Santos of CityCat. Now, Lizia is a mom, mentor, and startup founder of CityCat, a travel startup that aims to provide authentic travel experiences. Before launching her own startup, Lizia was a journalist in the U.S. and Brazil, both in online and print journalism. How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm doing great. How are you guys? Doing very well. It's a little overcast where we are today, but we're happy to be here. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about the history behind City Cat and uh, its mission. All right. So I don't think the idea for City Cat would come about if I was in hospitality. I part of uh, why I had the idea, uh, an idea so outside of the box, was really because of uh, who I am and my my different roles in life. As you mentioned, I I'm a mom, I'm a journalist, and I'm an expat. I'm from Brazil and moved to the U.S. Uh, 15 years ago. And uh, these three things kind of came together uh, and, and made me think about the idea. Why is that? It's because, um, first of all, before being a mom and a journalist, I was always a travel lover. Uh, my family is spread a- around the globe. My cousins, my aunts, everybody just lives abroad ever since I was little. We always either hosted family or went to visit family and friends. It's also a very Brazilian thing. No, mm-hmm. we're, just, we're very friendly. Everybody knows we're friendly. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're known for. Uh, and people just, it, like, it's way worse than you guys think. Like, it's friendly to the level of sending friends to friends to your house so you can <laughs> host them. <laughs> yeah. That's, that happens all the time. I get I get phone calls. Hey, can you host the, this friend of my friend? Uh, in your house, and that's that's how Brazilians are. They they have no clue, so you end up doing that a lot. That's very so friendly. That was the first thing. It is very friendly, friendly to the highest levels. <laughs> Annoying sometimes as <laughs> well. But I I became a passionate host uh, for that reason, and I also um, loved traveling to places where I had friends more than uh, going places where I didn't know anybody, because then. It, it just went uh, to another level where I found out that experiencing destinations through that insider view, it, it was just so much better than trying to find information online. And the other way around as well, when I hosted people, I just did my best to take them out, outside of the, the traditional touristic uh, circuits. In the U.S., I've lived in three states already, and I'm always the curious one. I just, I'm always trying to explore new places, find out about new cafes, uh, new like little museums that nobody hears about, these kinds of stuff. And I'm always taking people with me to these places when they come to visit. So this was the first thing that came to play. And then as a journalist, uh, you know, the f- first thing that every journalist has to do, like the main skill is you got to be a very good researcher. And, and that's, that's it. If you're not a good researcher, you're not a good journalist. So as a travel lover that goes online to plan my trips, I'm expected to be the best planner that is. Uh, Usually when I travel with family and friends, I'm the one assigned to plan. And it just, it's it's an experience that frustrates me a lot because although I'm good at researching and I can do that for any other subject, when it comes to travel, you go online and you type things to do in any given destination, you just find the same thing. Yeah, you know, the same top you're, 10. You're, yeah, you're in the 20th page of Google results and it's still <laughs> the same 20 top things to do in any given destination, which is a bunch of prepackaged uh, things, touristy things that anybody else will do. So for anybody looking to do anything that's more authentic, uh, if you want to really experience local culture, you just you have to keep going maybe to the 50th page of Google results and find that one blogger that couldn't manage to get up in the Google results. So it just, it's a, it takes a lot of time yeah. and it's supposed to be a fun experience, but it's not, uh, you know, when you're planning trips, you don't want it to resemble work. You're, you want to relax when doing that, but it's just not possible the way information is displayed online. 
And then the third role that I mentioned is I'm a mom. I have three boys, a nine, a six, and a five-year-old. Wow. And they're very different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they have different personalities. They love different things. And uh, when I'm planning trips for my family, I have to accommodate all of that. And plus, it has to be safe, right? I'm traveling with my kids. I'm not going to expose them to anything that's not safe. So uh, that added up to my frustration because now I'm, as a mom, try, I'm trying to plan something that's authentic. I'm trying to introduce my kids to this whole world out there that's amazing and all this diversity out there. But it's just so hard to plan. And when I do find something that says authentic, it's usually targeting younger millennials or Gen Zs that are adventurous that don't require lots of planning. They can just do whatever. Uh, so I couldn't find anything like that. And uh, that led me to to think through, you know, how can I solve that to myself first? And then I realized it's a problem for everybody else. So as a, as a journalist, I I, just, I had the aha moment when, where I realized maybe this is much simpler than anybody else thinks. Because uh, as journalists, what we do is any anytime we don't know anything about something, we just try to find a, a reliable source that can mm -hmm. educate us very quickly on what we need to do so we can then write the piece. Uh, so what if we could do this for travelers? What if we could create a community of these reliable sources and destinations that travelers could use as resources for planning trips? So I applied that very basic journalistic principle to a problem in hospitality, and that's where CityCat came to be. And then that's what that's what we are. We are in hospitality, but we joke within the team that we're not a travel company, actually. We are an out-of-the-box human resources company plus a personalized media. So it's it's very outside of the box. Uh, we're in travel, but we, essentially what we are is a community of people that you can use as resources when planning trips. And that follows that basic simple principles of uh, being a safe, authentic and personalized experience for anybody. Yeah. And um, you have a kind of, what am I looking for? A group of people that are referred to as cats. Um, mm -hmm. How, what are they? What do they do? And then how do you find them? Yes, that's uh, a great question. Uh, that's my passion within everything that I do in City Cat is building that community of cats. So what are cats? Uh, first of all, City Cat, the name of the company, has absolutely nothing to do with pets. Full disclosure, I don't even have any pets. <laughs> <laughs> I have three kids. That's enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> but it, it's just making reference to, you know, that cat, that cool cat, and uh, being the city cat. And also we're playing with the concept of cats being the one animal that's known as being the explorer. They always, they always leave the house. They go and explore the city. They always come back. So we thought it would be fun uh, to use that name. And then we ended up calling our local resources cats we just shorten it up for cats so i sometimes i forget that people are not familiar with the term but they will be it's going to be just kind of like google everybody will know cats uh they are knowledgeable people that we screen we recruit we train and we onboard into our platforms uh when i started city cat they were any regular people that could go through the process and prove their knowledge but uh, when I found out about this one concept called scalability, <laughs> that anybody starting a, a startup, if you haven't heard that yet, you will. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's something that you'll be challenged to achieve. Uh, then I realized it wasn't scalable to grow with, I couldn't grow a community of local people that way, because how could I even measure the knowledge of people all around the globe on destinations if I haven't been to every single destination in the world. So that wasn't scalable. It would take too long for me to grow that community. And that's when I had the idea for actually making them influencers. Mm -hmm. uh, that iteration was really important for us. So now, plus whatever I already said, they're reliable sources. They also have to be micro influencers. And uh, the subject of their profiles has to be either their local explorations or their trips. They, they can also be uh, passionate travelers that make it their thing to just travel to as many destinations as possible. So these cats, we go after them on social media 
we we have cat seekers within our company. These are interns whose goal is essentially finding these talents, these cats out there. And now uh, we we have a whole database of people that we're reaching out to. We do a cold reach out at first. Mm-hmm. That's the top of the funnel for us. We let them know who we are, if they're interested in the opportunity. And then from them on, uh, they have a whole onboarding process that they go through with CityCat. The main thing being uh, we want a diverse community. We want to be in every single destination. And we also have, we also want to build a diverse community within each destination. So travel, travelers can find people that they relate to. So we, we, don't have just moms. We have moms because, you know, I thought, okay, family friendly is important, but we have foodies. We have people that are very passionate about local people that are very passionate about touristy and we're expanding all of that. We have night owls. We'll have uh, coffee holics, you know, yeah. workaholics, <laughs> people that lo- like sports. So all of these categories, they are niches that they're passionate about and the travelers can then match up with them to have help when planning trips to that specific destination. Yeah, it's different, matching different needs for different travelers. And, and I, you know, looking through your site, you already have a huge list of places and people that um, know a lot about those places. So super cool um, business structure, really, and getting all of that started. So I like it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So you mentioned that uh, you had had this idea for CityCat. quite a long time ago and it had gone through Mm -hmm. different iterations um how did you know when you were at the right iteration and how did you really how did you how did you go about validating that yeah uh, that's that's a great question so when i first had the idea for city cat uh because it was based on my own experience as as a hostess uh the first idea was the cats being actual hosts for the travelers, not hosts in, in their own houses, but being sort of like out of the box travel guides, in-person guides. Uh, that was the initial idea. But when I started exploring the idea, I found out that the logistics was a nightmare to Im- implementing that. Yeah. Especially because I I wouldn't compromise the whole safety uh, right, right. side of it, as I mentioned, as a mom. And for it to be safe, it would involve a lot of technology that I would have to build in order to do something similar to what um, the other marketplace platforms are doing, like Uber, when the driver is coming and then you see them coming, things like that. This is all very expensive. I'm not a coder myself, so I had to think through that. I actually, uh, side story here, just so you understand why I had to iterate in the beginning. I actually raised a family and friends round right in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought I needed an app to make it work. The whole plan with the whole go out with a cat thing. And I spent all that money on an app development, which ended up not working out. The company that was doing that, I hired them from abroad. They ended up getting involved in a bigger project and they didn't finalize my app. So I spent all the money and I was left with nothing. And that that was the lowest uh, I was at my lowest then, and that's when I I had to think through, okay, am I going to give up or am I going to find a way to still make it work somehow? And that's when I understood, okay, maybe let me let me look at travel from, from another perspective. Let me understand how travel goes. And I understood them that there are different stages for, for any given trip. You first, you dream about it, then you plan then you go and you book your trip and then you experience and then you share about it. So in the beginning, I was completely focused on the experiencing uh, stage of it. And then, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of players in there. But then I saw the planning stage not being very much explored by any travel company. And I realized maybe here I have more chances of thriving. Maybe here I can scale my my recruiting of cats more. I can scale uh, providing traveler uh, services to travelers uh, further, yeah, and that's when I I focused on that and I try to find a way to serve travelers in that specific stage. And I also understood maybe the the thing isn't about the service in itself or the product in itself. This it's all about the cats. If I think about the cats as the sources, as the resources for the travelers, then from them I can provide 
a multitude of services. So let's start with something in the planning stage that's scalable. And we had the idea then for the plan with the cat. So you, you hire the cat to help you in the planning stage of it, of your trip. And uh, that becomes much more scalable because then we don't have to be in person. There's no in-person meetings. We right. don't have to have a native app. We can do a web app because in the planning stages, people usually plan in desktops anyway. So it became much more doable, uh, even in a technology side of it, attracting talent to, to make a web app versus Android versus iOS, all of that. Mm -hmm, so sure. it's, it's a lot of, if you just focus on the product and you don't think like higher, like think about the industry, think about different ways that you can approach it. Uh, there's always hundreds of ways that you can approach solving that problem. Don't compromise solving the problem, but as for the solution, there's so many ways that you can. And if you're not open to it, you probably die in the beginning. So right. I'm so grateful that someone challenged me to not die at that moment. Well, we're glad we're glad that uh, that your business didn't die. Um, if it did, we wouldn't be here today. So uh, yes. thank you, thank you for not. Um, you mentioned something that I want to go back to um, the unfinished app. I think mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a former founder myself, I think this is something that uh, people who don't have a lot of experience um, managing or handling um, tech teams, especially external tech teams, I think this is kind of our worst nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we reach out on Upwork or, or some sort of um, third party uh, situation and try to find a person or a team that can put together our vision of an app um, you know, no matter how uh, solid or blurry that vision uh, may be, um, if you, it, it sounds to me like the overall answer was, well, we don't necessarily need an app, but if you did need an app and you were to go about that again, um, how, would you, how would you do that process differently um, in finding a tech team or hiring out that process? Uh, more than finding the tech team is finding a tech co-founder, someone that understands techy language. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll, I'm not saying that people will deceive you. It might happen, as has happened to people that I know. It wasn't my case. They haven't deceived me, but they got involved in a bigger project. But it was, it could have been much better what I went through yeah. if I was knowledgeable about what they were talking about and I wasn't. So we just wasted a lot of time in that, in that process of trying to understand each other. If you do find a tag key person, not necessarily a co-founder or someone that you hire, but a friend, someone that can translate all of that for you, yep. you should have that person then go after whatever resources you need in tech. Uh, there's so much that goes into that. You have to find what's the right language. You have to create wire fit frames. You have to think about UX. I didn't even know what UX was. Absolutely. What, what was user experience? I had no idea what went into building an app. <laughs> so until I found a technical co-founder that translated all of that to me, yeah, it was a nightmare. I just wasted money and time, and I, I got really frustrated. So my advice for anybody starting now, and what I would do differently is I would find that person earlier, even if that person isn't the one to actually make the coding, mm -hmm. but, but it is the CTO, is that person that's taking charge of, of that aspect of, of the company. You can't do everything. You can't learn everything. It's just too much. Even like for someone like me that it's my job to learn something real quick and write about it and pretend I know what I'm talking about because that's what journalists do. <laughs> Uh, it, it wasn't possible. It's just not possible. It's a, it's a whole new world in, in itself. So I, that's my advice for anybody. Find a technical co-founder or a technical friend, someone that can help you then hire someone to outsource or whatever it is uh, that you need. I think that's really great advice. I, I think that, you know, as founders, we're expected to be experts in everything. But at some point, I think your expertise is to find someone who is the expert. And so I think that's exactly, I think yeah. that's really great advice. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's uh, it is. taking advantage of resources that are available to you. Um, and when that did happen, I mean, what was, you said that was your lowest point. 
How did you kind of rebound from that, from having to overcome an obstacle so early? So until then, to be honest, uh, I wasn't even aware of what's out there uh, in, in terms of resources for startups. I was, I was acting solo. I had mm-hmm. an idea. I wasn't even aware that I was a startup, to be honest. I, was, I had an idea and I was just trying to make it work. Uh, uh, then I had to go online and try to find something that could help me get out of that uh, hole. That's when I found out about uh, um, this conference in Miami called Emerge. Mm-hmm. It's a very large conference in, in, in Miami for like whole Latin America, not just America. And uh, not just North America, I mean. <laughs> So I ended up going to Emerge as an early stage startup. And uh, and there I found out about this world of resources out there for startups. One of them being uh, an accelerator that I ended up being a part a part of uh, by Babson. Mm-hmm. Babson uh, in, in Boston, uh, they have a specific cohort for women called the Win Lab, Women Innovating Now. Yeah. And Babson was a game changer for me. Not having a business background, there was a lot that I didn't know, and I didn't even know that I, ne- I needed to know. <laughs> so Babson really uh, challenged me to think beyond money and money that I needed to do anything because mm-hmm. your first thought as a founder is I need money to do that, and not necessarily. There's lots that you can do without money, but you do need to think and plan out how you're going to make that money in the future. And, and it's, that's also another mistake that we do as a founder. We think that a single service or product is going to take care of that. So Babson led me to think through, okay, you, you cannot rely on one single monetization avenue. You have to think through different ways to monetize. Startups, they're built to scale. How are you going to scale that? Mm-hmm. It can't. It can't rely on just you, or it can't be. It can rely even not just on your team. You have to build technologies or processes that will take care of uh, scaling that up for you. So they led me to think that my biggest resource wasn't the money that I lost. Right. I still had my biggest resource, which was myself and my, <laughs> if I, you know, my ang- my of. Uh, where's the word now? My hunger. Yeah. Myself and my hunger to keep fighting, that was my biggest resource. As long as I'm I'm willing to keep trying, then I can still find ways to to make it work even without money. So that was a turning point for me. That's when I iterated, that's when I thought about changing stages of providing help through the city cats. Yeah. And, and that was really what made me survive up to this point. Uh, and that's why I, I, I think it's amazing uh, providing services, uh, providing information through podcasts like this, because you, you can help other founders get up yeah. from low points like this. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, hopefully listeners can take from this story because, you know, talking about those low points, I think those are those that's where the, the real value it, it comes in. You know, we can we can talk about. Um, you know, when we, when we raise our next round or, um, when we make a great hire and that's, and that's great, but talking about those low points, I think is, is really where the rubber hits the road. Um, yes. so thank you for talking about this. Speaking of high points, uh, we've talked about your low points. Let's talk a little bit about, um, success, uh, as, mm-hmm. as, as a business, how do you measure success as a business? What are, what are some of the, you know, the KPIs that you pay attention to? And how do you keep away from um, following vanity metrics? Uh, yes, that's that's a great question. Um, you you get in the beginning when you're trying to build something, especially in technology, you tend to pay attention to the vanity metrics. You're, everybody is on top of you saying, "Yay, hey, they, they, these are the KPIs that you should be paying attention to," because this is this is what people are going to ask from you. But really, that's another thing that I've learned. Uh, is your business is unique and nobody knows more about your business than yourself. There's nobody better than yourself to set the KPIs for your growth. 100%. Don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't <laughs> fall for that uh, because they'll, they'll try to impose that on you. And uh, in my case, they're very unique because I'm building something that 
there isn't out there. There is no other uh, platform that is gathering influencers for trip planning. Mm -hmm. Right. So that being said, we had to come up with our own measures of success. And for us, it's um, mainly all about the cats. So our KPIs are things like the number of cat reach outs that we do every day, the, the amount of people in the top of the funnel that we're reaching out to and saying, hey, would you like to join our community? Another one is uh, number of cats being onboarded. So it's, it's all about how efficient we are in reaching out to them and bringing them into the platform without compromising the quality of what we're providing because we're, we're selling a reliable community of influencers. So if we want to keep being reliable, our onboarding process has cannot compromise that reliability, but it can, but it also has to be fast because I also want to provide a cat in every destination in the world. So for that purpose, we need to go fast. So it's uh, another KPI is the number of destinations with cats mm -hmm. and how many cats we have in each destination. And now uh, with all of these, we're trying to learn more about supply and demand and how we can uh, supply the demand really quick based on a, uh, travel seasons based on whatever, because in these days, nowadays, like any destination can become really famous in, in like a day. Yeah, absolutely. Depending, like there's a famous TikToker goes out there and does something, all of a sudden that destination becomes famous. So we're dealing with something really quick, uh, a crazy world now that, uh, that we have to respond very quickly. The other thing is that the, the number of conversion of, um, Hiring a cat versus just using a trip planner. City Cat provides a free trip planner. Anybody can go out there and, and plan a, tri a trip for free. Uh, not everybody has to hire a cat. So that conversion is important to us. And that's something that we're also trying to learn and is how we can make the higher that conversion even higher. How how can we attract people to going for the resource of a cat versus just trying to plan themselves? Make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's got like a kind of like the freemium model of uh, free versus uh, free versus get your paid cat. Um, it's a great model. Love it. Thanks. Yeah. And um, you've mentioned scaling um, a couple times already in, in, in discussing the number of cats and number of outreach and um, number of outreaches. Is that that's not sure. right. Hey, we'll, take it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it work. Um, um, how many people you're in communication with or hiring at, at any given time? Is that is that your is that how you'd like to scale? Do you have other things planning in the planning stages? Like, what does scaling up look like for City Cat? Um, so, and in, in general, scaling means us really getting really good at the supply demand thing with the cats. So uh, always responding quick, as mm -hmm. I, I just mentioned before. Uh, in terms of numbers, that is kind of tricky for us right now because at this point, we've been doing the top of the funnel in a, in a very manual way with the, the interns that we have on board that, I don't know if I mentioned that before, we call them the cat seekers. Mm -hmm. Fun name that we, we made up for that role. Uh, they are literally seeking cats all over the world, but there's a limit to how much we can find being that it's, it's completely manual at this point. Mm -hmm. We'd like to also turn that top of the funnel into something more scalable by doing that uh, through marketing, implementing marketing campaigns in that top of the funnel so we can reach out to a higher number of cats. In general, our conversion rates are really good. Mm -hmm. like yeah. For every 10 people we reach out, at least four respond positively and wow. end up becoming cats. Yeah. yeah. Because, because right now, being that the top of the funnel is cat seekers, is, is the interns that know exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for people that already show that they're fit through their profiles. They're travel lovers. They're passionate about their cities. Uh, they are diverse. So because we have a, a culture that's strong, they get attracted by that. So the conversion rates are, are big there, but we're working to raise those numbers uh, in a scalable way. Again, <laughs> I keep using scalable. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix of people and also technology. In our case, we would need to apply some technology to the process to make it easier to grow those numbers. So we would like to double the team 
so we can achieve that. Uh, today, a great part of my team is focused on the cats, on the supply. I would like to grow the, the number of cats that we have, like at least five times by the end of this year. Wow. wow. <laughs> also destinations that we have cats on. So my ultimate goal is having a cat in every single destination. Think about an island in the middle of nothing, nowhere. I want you to have a cat there. We actually have a cat in the uh, island of Cyprus. And I'm really proud of that. <laughs> That's one weird destination that we have someone in. And it's a little and niche. I love that. But it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's very niched. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. And it sounds like it, I mean, 40%, not just response rate, but positive response rate. That's, yes. I, it sounds to me like you could really put on a masterclass of targeting and pitching. I mean, it's, it, you've, it sounds like you've really got this down. Um, and you said that, you know, that you're, you're doing a lot of top of funnel stuff that doesn't scale, but I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard the, you know, the Airbnb story, um, where the, the folks at Y Combinator said, Hey, you, you can't do scale things right now because you don't have scale. And so yeah. really doing those things that don't scale, why you yes. don't have scale, it's it's a, a an excellent learning opportunity. And I'm sure yeah. that you've really that's part of the reason why your your positive response rate is so strong. Yeah. Um, uh, on top of that, one thing that I did that didn't scale whatsoever at all is I used to onboard them personally. I would have a call with each one of them as the CEO of the company. I already had a team that was looking into them, but I, I made it a point to be the one welcoming them. And that that's also one reason why lots of people that started with us a year ago when we didn't have a platform are with us to this day. Mm -hmm. It's because I took the time to sit down and say, hey, here's who I am. Here's what I'm building. I'm just this regular person. Got interrupted by my kids a couple times, you know. Yeah. And, and people, they, they saw that, I'm just this person trying to build something. They wanted to be a part of that. So that that doesn't scale at all, but it is. it was very important to the foundation of City Cat. And I'll bet you those early cats that that you had those discussions with, they're probably some of your best your best cats. Uh, they and, are. They pro and they probably will be for a, for a long time. And we'll talk more about um, culture a little bit later, but it sounds like you've really, done everything you can to embed culture in all of your touch points, um, which Absolutely. is really amazing to hear. Um, I want to segue a little bit into um, business over this past year. You, you're, in, uh, you're in an industry, obviously, that, um, that has seen a huge uh, change in these past mm -hmm. two years. Um, so I'll ask you the basic question, and you can take it however you want. How did COVID impact your business? and the cats, the employees, um, and the people that you work with? For City Cat, uh, and I, I have to be very careful how I put this because COVID was awful. And then let's just leave it like that. But for us, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because uh, we, we, did, we had uh, an early MVP that we were gonna launch right two weeks, right, two weeks before everything happened. Wow. And uh, then we started seeing all the news about it. And I started, uh, I decided to hold on, hold off on that mm -hmm. and, and just observe for a while. And uh, at that point, we always told, like in my speeches about CityCat, every time I pitched, I always told my niche is the cautious traveler. It's the traveler that cannot afford not to plan for any reason. Turns out that throughout COVID, the niche grew. Mm -hmm. The cautious traveler now became pretty much 60% of the market. Yeah. People now know that anything can happen overnight, literally, even a worldwide, worldwide pandemic. So the niche grew. And uh, with that, it opened up an opportunity even bigger for us. I honestly, at that point, also, I had an iterated for the whole uh, influencer model. And uh, that's also another thing that led me to do this because I'm like, well, since the niche is growing, how can I make it even safer for, for these travelers? How can I make them feel even more comfortable within the platform? And that's when we had the idea for the CityCast being influencers because now 
they can they're socially validated you can check up on them you can see they're real you can see that they're knowledgeable yourself you can go and visit their profiles so all of that happened throughout the pandemic me getting that idea the iteration obs observing the the industry and, and how it reacted and then we decided since we have the time let's just be let's just become really good at recruiting these influencers and everybody was just at home doing nothing. So we ended up probably reaching out much more influencers because of the pandemic than in any other, if, if it was any other uh, time. So to us, it ended up impacting us in a very positive way. Plus I also was able to recruit lots of the team members throughout the pandemic. People were working from home. They had much more time available. And I was able to recruit people from high executive um, levels and big hospitality companies to fill up gaps that I needed, not being from hospitality. And I don't think that would happen if it wasn't for the pandemic. So again, very being very careful with saying that. Right. Because right. it was awful at the same time. But to us, it gave us time to change the wheels before going on a road trip. Yes. <laughs> and and it, it ended up being a blessing. Good, good. I'm, I am glad to hear that. Um, you know, that the whole travel industry was really kind of having to pivot and adjust really quickly. So um Congratulations. I mean, that was taking an opportunity and, um, and running with it is great. Um, if we could come back to City Cats company culture, um, mm -hmm. the cats, when you were originally hiring them, you were talking to them one on one. We recognize now that that's a little difficult to keep up with as you keep adding yes. and adding and adding. But yeah. how does how does how do you maintain that kind of personal touch within your culture and what's important to you about the culture that you have now? Um, so first of all, uh, giving it uh, some foundation, uh, what's, what ended up becoming our culture, it was a, it's a pretty natural process because it, it kind of came from who I am mm -hmm. and my first uh, team members and who we are as, as people. So as I mentioned, and you guys mentioned, I, I'm a mom, I am a travel lover, I'm an expat. So all of that kind of translates our company, company's culture. We are diverse. We welcome diversity. We think diversity is the most amazing thing there is out there. We love everything that's local and that's very authentic, that represents the local culture. We all love travel, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and our city cats are also very family oriented. Even if they're not parents, they're, they're just family oriented. So that, that was a discussion I had. Uh, the family part of it, just a side note here. Uh, in the beginning with my co-founder, my co-founder is my aunt. Uh, when I had the idea, I invited my aunt to join me because she is in hospitality. She was the president of a big hotel here in Orlando for more than 10 years. So I'm like, she has what I don't. I'm not good with finances, admin, <laughs> operations, all of that. So she complimented me and uh, in the beginning, we kind of pretended we didn't, we weren't family. We're like, I'm calling her by her first name and like, we're trying right. to be very professional. <laughs> and then we just realized this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's, not, it's not who we are. You are my aunt and I'm going to be proud of saying that. And actually let's just make it a part of our company's culture mm -hmm. instead of, you know, pretend, being this closed group of like we're family and then the rest is outsiders let's make it our thing. Let's be a big family. Let's, because that's who we are as a family too. We all love hosting. We are, we're always having people over for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, whatever. Let's do that with our company as well. So this became a big thing for us as a company. And uh, it ended up attracting the right people. And that's, that's something that it, I became very passionate about. Ended up like happening naturally. But now I realize that it was just a blessing to me that ended up happening naturally. And I feel bad for people that don't mm -hmm. prioritize that in the beginning because you end up attracting the wrong people. And then you have to course correct things and it sucks. Okay. So yeah, I, I think that was a follow-up question that I forgot. No, <laughs> you nailed elaborated. it. Yeah, no, great, <laughs> great, great answer. Um, but keeping going uh, 
and discussing the the family aspect of this business how do you there are some of us i'm sure that think of like man working with my family no no thank you but how did <laughs> how did you balance that and that close relationship you had um and versus your non-family employees how does that kind of balance out you know my my family is not perfect like you'll have the occasional people wanting to take advantage <laughs> of of what you built this is, is just what happens with families but i i wouldn't say you know everybody go and, and found a, a company with your family it really depends on how your family is the family dynamics mm -hmm. the the person in the family that you choose as well i i chose someone that's very mature and ended up balancing me in so many ways so it wasn't that hard for me being that she respected me a lot she's a professional she's a leader herself mm -hmm. So she and she understood what I had that she didn't, and vice versa. So we respected our our roles. She doesn't like being a spokesperson. I'm the face of the company. She's in the in behind the scenes. So we respect uh, each other a lot. We do have an, a, another a cousin that works with us. Uh, that's in hospitality as well, but. At the same, also, same way, she was also very experienced in hospitality and, and respected the roles. And then from then on was just, once we realized, okay, let's embrace the fact that we're family, it just came, it became easy. Mm -hmm. Everybody else that came on knew about us being a family. And uh, we made it our thing to make them feel like, like a family as well with us. So it didn't, it wasn't hard for me. Yeah. Uh, you got to check back with me in a couple of years. <laughs> See how it goes. I'll give you a call. So far, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and just like what we were talking about earlier, it goes back to putting the right people in the right positions. Don't just mm -hmm. play to your strengths, play to everyone's strengths. You and Yes. Yeah, it sounds like you had some, some good folks to pick from, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk about something um, outside of outside of CityCat for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, something that you mentioned in our questionnaire was that uh, you mentor early stage minority founders. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like. So that first happened uh, through Babson. Uh, once I graduated from Babson, and I didn't realize that I, I was ready to mentor at all. Like I didn't feel like I, I could be a mentor yet. I, I did became passionate about it because I saw how it played an important role within my journey. Mm -hmm. I was about to give up and then they helped me with uh, resources and, and that lifted me up. So I remember having that conversation with my aunt and saying, hey, once we reach such a stage that, that we feel comfortable with doing that, I would love to go back and mentor. I would love to also help any accelerator like this in any way I can. Because one big thing with Babson specifically and, and it being accelerator geared towards women is that it helped me realize that there's many resources within me being a woman that I could leverage instead of, instead of looking at it as a weakness, I, I could leverage it. Like many people would look at me and say, hey, you're a mom, this is a weakness. Right. You cannot do this at this stage because you're a mom. Babson looked at me and said, hey, you're a mom, which means you're a great multitasker. Absolutely. That's a great <laughs> skill yeah. for a founder. So all of these things, they just they changed my, the way I, I saw things. And uh, my mindset is really everything. So that led me to want to do something like this for people. It Like a year went by. And one day I received an email from Babson inviting me to be a pitch uh, competition judge. And I went and did that without really believing I could do that. But I, surprisingly, I added so much to that, uh, to that moment. I had feedback to give and it wasn't like, I just, it just, I had it because I've done it. <laughs> I, I, I've been there before, but I didn't feel like it yet. But when I went through that initial moment of judging those pitches and helping those uh, girls, I, I realized, okay, I, I, maybe I can do that already. I'm not super successful yet. City Cat's not a global brand yet, but I'm, I'm ahead of them. Right. I've been there. So I realized that there was a specific niche that I could help even more, which is the minority early stage founders 
that that's me in a nutshell. I'm just a couple steps ahead. So I got invited to go back and do that for uh, another cohort, but now for a bit a longer period. And I've been doing that ever since. I love sitting down with these early stage founders and and setting like initial expectations, giving them the initial resources for things that it's just normal for me to talk about now. But for people like in, in these initial stages, I remember I didn't even know I was a startup to begin with. Yeah. And <laughs> whatever comes with it. So that that is is to me uh, a great joy. Ended up being also part of the culture of the company. We established uh, an internship program within the company where we invite uh, students. They don't have to be business students, but students who, who have an entrepreneurial mindset and any field that they want to apply that entrepreneurial mindset. And we invite them to come and win in CityCat and uh, work with us for a couple of months and whatever they want to work with. We give them opportunities to hop from job to job and experience things so this, they can find themselves and then get out there feeling confident within their skill set. So I'm mentor- mentoring all, all around. I also homeschool my kids. <laughs> so wow. My whole life is a mentoring. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Mentoring. What work-life balance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, and that's amazing. You know, I, I find that, and I think, I think it's widely accepted that um, a mentor that is closer to you, but ahead of you is, is more helpful than somebody who is so far ahead. Like, if I'm going to start, you know, a, so a business right. tomorrow, I would rather have someone who, a, knows the business that I'm going to start, and b, isn't that far ahead of me and that has some real life experience. I would rather have that than, you know, Elon Musk as my quote unquote mentor, just because it's more relevant to the context mm-hmm. of the situation that you're in. Um, yeah. And so on the on the subject of mentors. Um, you said that you've gone through um, Babson's, which is uh, Women Innovating Now. Is that, is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, All correct. Right. Uh-huh. Um, which is an accelerator. Um, did But did you have a specific person or team who was a mentor to you? Uh, not throughout the whole thing. I've had mentors in different stages of the company, uh, depending on what I needed at the moment. Uh, I'd say my first mentor in, in within City Cat's journey was my own aunt, being in hospitality for so long. She was the one that opened my eyes to the industries ins and outs because mm-hmm. I, I wasn't knowledgeable about the industry to start with. And then in the process, I've had different people. Uh, there was a moment where I was trying to find more about traction and building a company, building a company culture, all of that. I had a specific person in that moment. Uh, there was a moment where, where I, was, I was focused on products and rebranding the whole company. I went after a childhood friend who's in, in marketing and who's in hospitality as well. And he was my mentor for a while. Then with funding, I sought out another person. I To this day, I haven't had one single person. That could be the case for some people. It just didn't happen with me. But I'm open to that totally open to that. But with the founders that I've helped, it was it's, it was the same way as well. I've helped them through some parts of the process of building the, uh, the company and then someone else came in. I'm always happy to refer them yeah. to whatever resource they need well, in the next stage. Those networks of resources, I mean, goes back to what we were talking about earlier with having a technology person, like those resources can be invaluable. Oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, they can buy you so much time. Yeah. Like, oh, that's what that means. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we had mentioned one of those like golden words or phrases right now that's been floating around, um, work-life balance. <laughs> and it sounds like you, you, have, you have a very full, full work life and full life life. How do you, how yeah. do you keep that in check? I've tried it all. <laughs> I've tried, you know, tight schedules, uh, to-do lists, whatever, name it. I've tried it. And I don't think there's a formula for anybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, You really have to try and find what works for you. In my case, it's just being very productive all the time. And whenever I have a little bit of time, I'm like, what can I get done right right now? If I'm walking 
in my house, you know, I have three boys. So you can imagine <laughs> yes, <laughs> how life goes here. There are swords everywhere. There are balls <laughs> everywhere. So like, I'm just trying to make the most of my time. I'm walking towards another room in the house and I see something here that I can grab with me and take to the next room and put away. I do it right then. I don't plan, you know, let me do this on Saturday when I know I what works for me is this, just getting things done all the time. And that goes for my personal and work life. I don't really have a time set apart for working. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of everything at the same time. That might not work for everybody. I am very hyper. So I, I'm busy and I'm happy being busy. For some people, it might take, you know, really setting up part times. They couldn't, maybe they couldn't work with the kids around. To me, it works. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard for me. I don't I don't think there's a balance. Yeah, <laughs> I think you choose. You either choose being very busy or not. And if you choose, just be ready. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it literally is getting busy all the time. You know. So you're max you're maximizing your your time really at that point. Yes. And yes, I use a lot of technology. My I have Alexa's all over the house. <laughs> I have I use Siri as my friend as well. You know, I'm using everything that I can also in technology. And when you do have a moment to kind of breathe or when you need that kind of like alone time or downtime, is there anything you go to to sort of unwind? Yes. I work out. I love biking. Okay. I bike to my gym. <sighs> and I love uh listening to audiobooks while doing that while working out. I, I don't like working out with people. I used to. I grew up playing volleyball. I loved group sports. Mm -hmm. But now that time is such a commodity. <laughs> I have to make the most out of it. And I, I need to listen to audiobooks and read books to educate myself. So I do it while working out because then I forget about the pain of working out as well. <laughs> it works great for me. <laughs> and biking uh, is, is big for me because being in the outside and just you know, the, the wind blowing in your face, it just relaxes me so much. So it's a different day for me. If I, if I get to work out that day, the whole day goes different. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that one, but we, uh, we choose to listen to very different things <laughs> during workouts. I'm a, I'm a heavy metal girl. So, oh, but, really? yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, the extra, the exercise I've, we've heard that from a couple founders now and it's, it can be crucial to like balancing out the day. So totally, I might it have, gives you lots of energy. I might have to try audiobooks though. <laughs> do it, do it, but choose ones. If you're a heavy metal girl, you gotta <laughs> find something that's upbeat. Don't, don't choose audiobooks that <laughs> you know, talk about too many lows. Right, <laughs> no, no Neil like deGrasse <laughs> Tyson. I'd be laying on the no. floor like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> um, cool, 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 I love it. Yeah. So many exercise people. Um, <laughs> and then kind of one other, a little bit general question, but what's what's something that surprised you in, in launching your startup? Uh, the traditional way of doing business was, you know, a lot of planning before executing. Mm -hmm. So you had to have a business plan. And, and, and that's how it was for me in the beginning when I didn't know about, you know, things changed so much in the past three, four years. Absolutely. It, it seems like it was just yesterday, but really there wasn't that, that many resources available when I started CityCat. And my line of thought was that I had to do things in a traditional way. So I had just had a baby. I have three boys and I had one newborn, uh, one one year old and one three year old when I had the idea for CCAT. And, but I was so passionate about the idea that I didn't want to let it die. So I'm like, I have to keep going, moving forward with this. But I thought that I needed to learn so much, know everything about everything. I needed to craft this perfect business plan mm -hmm. in order to have CCAT get off the ground. I had to have uh, legal advice, it's so much stuff that I, thought I needed to have. And I actually wrote a business plan. You know, I put my baby to sleep and then I would sit down and write a little bit. And I did that for a couple of days 
and I have a business plan. It has nothing to do with what we're doing nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> it makes absolutely no sense. But I thought I had to have it all figured out. And as I pursued the, the, the journey of building the company, especially startup, that this it's built to grow and, and scale fast, I realized it's not about having everything planned out. It's not about knowing everything, really. It's, it's about being open to iterating and changing and responding quickly and, and surrounding yourself with the right people. When I realized that, that was a game changer for me. And that's that was something that I didn't expect uh, when building a business. I thought I would need to be very smart first, get an MBA or something like that. It, it really isn't like that. Anybody can be a founder if you just put the right people around you and uh, put the right mindset also in, in motion. Yeah, it sounds like flexibility is yes, is yes. really a skill that that one must have to to be a founder mm-hmm. because you, just like what you said, there are going to be be iterations at some points in time. You may have to pivot off of your off of your main idea. Um, yeah. So so being able to be to be flexible and when you find that thing, hit it at full speed and give it everything you've got. Um, one more question, Absolutely. just about yeah. being a founder. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you may not sleep anyway. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but as a founder of CityCat, what keeps you up at night? It is people. And my I'm a people person. And uh, when building a company that's all about people, uh, and essential, essentially it is, it is people and uh, building something yeah. that they feel like they're a part of, in my mind, in my vision, they're so special. What I have here, that what I envision for CityCat is so big, it's so special. I want people to feel like they're a part of that, but it's hard translating that vision into everyday things that really gets to them. You know, that my, not, and when I say people, I'm saying my team, my, every CityCat within the company, how do I make them feel like they're special because they really are. But sometimes things are just inside our hearts and we can't really translate it into and into actions. So I'm always thinking about that. What can I do? What can I, what resource can I put out for the cats? Uh, what message can I send them? What video can I record and send? So we're trying different ways to do that uh, every day in the company. And I, I realize now I, that's another thing that I learned with the processes, that's the main thing about being a CEO. It's not knowing everything about numbers. You have people that do that, operational people that are working on numbers every day, but it is working with your people, inspiring. It's, you're really an architect of, of, your, of your team and how your team is gonna uh, grow together. So that's what keeps me awake for sure. All right. So speaking of cats and working back in with your company culture, how do they fit in? How how do they how do you incorporate them and 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 make them part of your family um, kind of company style? Okay. Um, so for us, we're very intentional with building that community of cats. Uh, they are the cats meow. Ah. The, the cats are the cats meow <laughs> of our company. <laughs> So we we really intentional in and having them know that uh, through different initiatives, we we have one person in the, in the executive team uh, that's in charge of the cats and uh, her job role is the cat chief cat chief officer. So she's the the big cat person and then under her uh, there's a whole team just focused on on the cats, and uh, we do different initiatives. Uh, the whole onboarding process uh, in itself is very unique. It's a mix of uh, them being brought into the company by automated things, but also we do a lot of personal touch points Mm -hmm. where they talk to the team, they have video calls, they get introduced to the company. They have direct access to us through different channels, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, name it. Uh, We're available in any of these channels because uh, we we understand that they're they're the biggest thing. around here. Also, the other thing that we have is until recently, we had a private Instagram account just for cats, just for us to share our own trips, our own local explorations and for them to know each other. 
and now this has also it, it, now it's it's become a public account but geared towards the cats as well and recruiting the cats but it was a space for them in the beginning when we were just building the community to interact with each other and uh, we have the cat academy so the cat academy is uh, is a place where they learn about the company where they learn about the industry where they get informed about the best practices but it also will become a place of sharing resources within the cats so being a city cat is not a full-time job. It's something that you do to earn some extra income. These cats are influencers. They have full-time jobs in several fields. We have cats that are uh, teachers. We have cats that are personal trainers, that are flight attendants, all sorts of therapists. So we want these cats also to feel proud to be a part of our community that is united by the local but by our love for all that's local, all that's diverse. And uh, within the Cat Academy in the future, that's going to be a place unique and exclusive for cats for them to share resources. So a therapist can create a whole course about, um, I don't know, happiness within a pandemic. <laughs> Just throwing that because <laughs> that might happen again. I don't know. Yeah. But whatever it is, uh, they can share the, the, the resources through the Cat Academy. The flight attendant can share resources about best practices for flying. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's going to be a place for that as well. So we're intentionally building things just for the cat community. There's the technology for the travelers and to serve travelers through the interaction with the cats, but there's the technology being built just for the cats and within their feedback as well. They always they also know when they're onboarded that they're they're heard, their voice is heard within the company, whatever uh, resource they feel like it would be useful with providing the services, uh, we also wanna build upon their requests. So it's a, it's a bunch of intentional things that we're doing so they can feel like they're valued within the company because they really are. But uh, that's the challenge, right? Making them feel like it. Yes, yes. Right, so you're, you're, you're truly building a community for these like-minded folks who, it probably at the end of the day won't even feel like work to them. Yes, that's the goal. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. It, it sounds. I mean, it really sounds like you're you're firing on all cylinders. You've got you've got a you know a SaaS product. You you run a two sided marketplace. You're building a community for for these. What what aren't you doing? <laughs> <laughs> not I'm not sleeping. Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Homeschooling the kids. I mean, you really. You're 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 Wonder Woman. It's it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sleeping, and I probably I'm not I'm not eating very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you mentioned in the community, uh, you guys talk and share uh, personal travel stories. Do you have any mm -hmm. personal travel stories that uh, that make a make a, a splash at parties? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to mention something real quick. Uh, that's part of the foundation of City Cat. Sure. I have, uh, as I mentioned, my family lives uh, abroad. I have cousins from like America to the other side of the world, Japan. Like I have cousins everywhere. Uh, one of my cousins, she's in marketing and she's lived in New York for a couple of years. Now she's back in New York. But when I was young, she was already living in New York. And we were going to go on a trip to New York and she created a whole itinerary on paper for us. Uh, she's very creative, so she loves drawing as well. So she got like little yellow papers and she made that uh, handmade guide to New York outside of the box. So she was sort of like a cat for us. She didn't have the trip planner that we have now, but she created that for us. And uh, my first time in New York was through her lenses, through her eyes, which was way beyond whatever anybody else is experiencing. So that's just a side note. Uh, it's not the funniest story, but it's something that's uh, that I hold special. It's very special, and I have that guy to this day. It's wow. an inspiration for that's City Cat. Awesome. The second uh, story is just of, uh, just to show how crazy I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, so as I mentioned, I moved here uh, 15 years ago, and I spoke half of the English I do now. And I came on a student visa. I had just graduated from my bachelor's in journalism, and I started a master's. Uh, degree here and my first first place that I lived on was Kentucky and uh, a tiny town in Kentucky called Campbellsville and I was broke super broke so I, I bought a, a Honda Accord 92 
And my dad came and brought me from Brazil to the U.S. And we drove from Boston to to Kentucky. He dropped wow. me off there, went back to Brazil. And I was by myself in Kentucky, 20-year-old with that Honda Accord 92 that uh, had the, the tank had a, had, a, had a hole in it. So I can only fill it up up to half of it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And, and the ignition of the car was always failing too. So I had to kick it in oh, order no. to turn it yes. off. <laughs> but me being the travel lover that I was, I, I, I had to travel. I know I yeah. was in the middle of nowhere. I had nobody to, to spend time with. So I had to travel. I travel all around that area, the Midwest of the US with the Honda Accord, kicking the ignition <laughs> and filling the tank up to half. Up until the point where I finally was able to transfer my college to Boston, where my fiance was. Yeah. And I traveled back to Boston in my Honda Accord. But I had, uh, it was back when you had to, to print Google Maps and follow the instructions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was going <laughs> from Kentucky to Boston on a Google Maps that I had printed. And somewhere in the middle of Ohio, I, I misread something. I didn't follow a direction. I got lost. No. <laughs> Thank Ohio, just farms all around you. Oh, yeah. You know, that scene out of a horror movie where you get stuck in the middle of nowhere. There's cornfields everywhere. With, with a car, <laughs> with a half tank car. Oh, no. <laughs> that whole trip was nuts. I ended up buying a, I, I found a gas station, I bought an Atlas, and I, I ended up going all the way to Boston with just the Atlas. I was. I, Wow. Thank God I'm really good with directions. Yeah. <laughs> My parents instilled that on me. And I, I got lost several times. By the time I got to New York, there was a storm. I couldn't see up uh, like a feet on, <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> I was completely lost. I almost hit the car like several times. That trip was a 24 hour trip that I survived. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm so glad to be here telling this story. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It wasn't, it wasn't like your fun experience, authentic trip. It was authentic in the sense that I authentically Definitely. got lost many times. <laughs> A crash course in Midwestern geography. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Turn left at the cornfield. Yeah. <laughs> if you pass the pink house, you have gone too far. Right. <laughs> yes. In New York, I got lost at a moment. And then I called my fiance. He's like, oh, I have a friend in New York that you can call. And then I called a friend and I'm like, hey, I'm lost. And he's like, where are you? I'm like, seriously, if I knew where I was, I would be lost. So, it's kind of part of the definition. Like, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and what, what kind of like, because they ask, what's around you? In New York, everything is the same. It's a bunch of streets and buildings. <laughs> what right. am I going to say? <laughs> I don't know. There's a tall building here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's it's uh it's brick. Um, it's got some doors, some windows. <laughs> right. From cornfields to brick buildings. That was in one day. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a, that's a character building I got it trip. All in one day. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. I like that story. I think you have to have one of those. You have to have one don't of those. Don't try that. Don't try to sit home, oh, y'all. Yeah. Don't do For it. For sure. <laughs> um. So just. But you were so great. You've been so great to talk to. Um, do you have advice for anyone that's sitting at home like, man, I think I, I think I want to start this. What's your advice for anyone looking to um, become an entrepreneur? Yes, um, I would say don't overthink your product or your service. Be aware that, that that's going to change. What you really have to be mindful about is the problem that you're solving is that a real pain point for enough people that it justifies you starting that business? If yes, then you're already halfway through it. If you obsess about that, then the rest will follow. And that's one thing that I think you should obsess on is, is the product, the pain point. The other thing is the culture. I cannot stress that enough. It feels like it's silly. Like, why would I think of culture before the product? Right. If I'm, I don't even have a team or anything, you know, it, it sounded silly in the beginning, being the CEO of nothing. I was CEO <laughs> of myself. <laughs> but the thing is, if you don't think that through, you will attract the wrong people or mm -hmm. you will attract no people. <laughs> so if you know what you're building, if you know what kind of company and vision you have in mind, if you're thinking like 10 steps ahead and you know what it is that you want to get to, 
you will attract the right people. And you'll also be aware of what you cannot do in the process of getting there. And then you'll know, you'll know who is the people that you have to attract, what kind of skill sets you need uh, in order to make that work. So that is my advice for you. It feels like it's nothing right now. It's just an idea, but obsess about that. Think what kind of company, what is the pain point? And then be open, be flexible to it changing through the process of building it because it will it will change. Who would have think? Who would have thought that a pandemic <laughs> would happen? Right. Right. And that changed the whole travel industry. So and Absolutely. all other industries too. So it really did. That's really really great advice. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming in today. Before we wrap up, is there anything that our listeners can do? to help you out. Um, how do people sign up to be a cat? Uh, what else, what else can we do? What else can we do for you? Yes, a uh, couple ways. Uh, you could get involved with City Cat by being a cat or by hiring a cat, but you can also get involved by referring us cats. So there's three ways that you can get involved. If you go on citycat.com and you wanna be a cat, you just press on be a cat there and you you can follow the onboarding process. To be a cat, you just have to be a micro influencer with an account that is focused on either your local explore, explorations or, or travel. You have to have a minimum number of uh, following uh, followers, but that depends on the social media that you're using to validate your your uh, knowledge of your destination. You can be a blogger, you can be an Instagram and TikTok, it doesn't matter. If that's you, we would love to have you. If you know someone that would love to be a cat, either you know them personally or you follow someone that you love, uh, we have a referral program already for that. So you can earn by referring cats to us. And uh, also if you go on the Be A Cat pro, uh, page, there will be a link there for referring cats. And plan trips with us. We have a free trip plan where you can plan trips in a very easy way. It's, it's very, very simple, kind of like Google Docs. You start planning something, you invite people without having to figure out any other features within the, the, the planner. That's free, you can do it now. Or hire a cat if you wanna have an authentic and amazing experience. It's, it's kind of like Wonderlust for all, right? You, you don't have to just watch people having fun, you can have fun too, just like them. So th those are ways you can get involved. Tell people about City Cat. That, that's another way, a fourth way there. Awesome. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Uh, audience, we will put all of these links in the show notes. Um, and I think that's going to be a wrap for today's episode of Startup Savants. Uh, we want to thank you for stopping by and listening in. Hey, do you want to chime in? If you think we're doing a good job or you think we're doing terrible and got nothing right, let us know in the comments. We read every single comment, do our best to learn from you. For tools, guides, videos, startup stories, and so much more, head over to truick.com. That's truick.com, T-R-U-I-C.com. See you, folks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.